uh, Board of Trustees of the American Psychological Foundation. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we have a real treat today, my good friend and colleague at Boston University, Dr. David Barlow, who um, will be our fireside chat participant. And um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity uh, to, um, um, to talk with Dave and to um, have him give us a sense of his career and his accomplishments, his achievements, and um, and a variety of other things that he's at. Um, while he is um, professor of psychology and psychiatry at Boston University Emeritus, um, I think he's working harder than like 98% of the people <laughs> that I know and um, is still, is still um, in great demand by lots of people to get things done. Um, Dave, as I think many of you know, has been um, president of multiple organizations over the course of his career, most significantly um, AABT come ABCT. Um, many years ago, I think he was about uh, 12 when he was president of ABCT. <laughs> and um, and uh, he, he has continued to be a leader um, in psychology, clinical psychology. There are some who say that Dave is the most influential clinical psychology of the generation. And, uh, and I'm certainly one of those people um, who would say that. And uh, uh, he has uh, certainly influenced me and my career over the course of many years. Dave uh, ended his career at uh, Boston University, but prior to that, he was at the State University of New York at Albany. Um, prior to that, he was at Brown University where he established the very prestigious um, internship and fellowship training programs. Um, prior to that, he was at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, again, another um, influential training program that he established uh, back in the late sixties. And um, from Brown and Mississippi have come many um, influential psychologists over the course of uh, uh, the last um, 40 or 50 years. So um, we have an opportunity to talk with him about his career and about um, some of the vision that he has uh, moving forward. Um, in the field of clinical psychology. So uh, with that um, uh, brief introduction, I could go on, for, you know, the hundreds and hundreds, six, 700 publications that Dave said, um, but I think you'd rather hear from Dave about some of his thoughts. Um, so let, let's start, uh, Dave, with um, um, what influenced you to enter the field of psychology? You went to the University of Notre Dame, and then you're at Boston College for a bit, and then at University of Vermont. Um, how did that path arise for you? What, did, what influenced it? Well, that, this has always been a topic that's been of uh, some interest to me, you know, how careers unfold, how yeah. interests unfold, how life develops. There's so much serendipity uh, in it all. But first, let me say, Terry, thanks very much for uh, the uh, nice uh, introduction. Terry and I, for people listening, many of whom know, I get to see some nice chat messages from old friends and it's great to see uh, people uh, uh, listening in. Hope we, hopefully we can talk later. But Terry and I have been colleagues for, uh, oh my God, longer than we probably we both like to say, 40 plus uh, 40 years. 40 something years, yeah. Something like that. And um, so, you know, one of the great rewards before I answer your question, you know, one of the great rewards of, of, of a career, and particularly in psychology, is uh, becoming friends, uh, you know, longtime friends with um, such uh, terrific people whose main interests in life are helping other people and, uh, you know, doing good, good for the field, producing new psychologists, uh, treating patients and the like. And uh, to form these lasting friendships that last uh, almost a lifetime, or really, really just about a lifetime. Um, for me, it's been a very, um, you know, long career or long and, and very uh, enjoyable career of 50 plus years. So, um, and made so many good friends along the way that I've kept in touch with. Um, like many people, I came into the field uh, quite by accident. I was the first in my family to go to college. So um, it wasn't like I had, you know, uh, role models, uh, professional role models, but I was always from a very young age fascinated by why people did the things they, they did, why they reacted the way that they did, why some people reacted with the individual differences, why some people would react one way to something when 
give it given somebody who would say something. Another one would react the other way. So one of my, uh, as I've mentioned to some people over the years, one of my uh, less endearing traits uh, growing up was being a big practical joker. And what that meant was setting up a situation, you know, that was somehow improbable or would result in an unexpected uh, outcome, often funny, to me at least, not to them, <laughs> you know, to, to the people yes. and seeing how they reacted, you know. And um, I said, wow, this is really interesting. And, and uh, one other aspect, which it's amazing how much this has been an influence uh, over the years over, over for many people is that in the 60s, in the late 50s, I think when I was growing up and TV was, you know, there were TV programs, which uh, hadn't been, been on that long, but one of them was, and I can't remember the name of it, it was a program and there was a psychiatrist and a clinical psychologist on it. And I think Robert Culp was maybe one of the stars a long time ago. And um, I thought, you know, this clinical psychologist, this is really a neat guy. Look at these things he's doing. And, you know, he'd often be, in those days, he'd be giving projective tests, <laughs> doing things like that. But it would be very dramatic, you know, and built into this narrative. And, and then, you know, and, and then it would all usually have a good outcome. And I thought, wow, that is really, really neat. So the ironic thing is, in terms of the influence of television on one's uh, sort of outlook and careers. When I got to Mississippi, uh, my first job was in Mississippi in 1969. And it was a shock to me that I ended up there. Talk about serendipity, you know, being a Boston, New England born and bred, you know, Boston boy. But um, <clears throat> the, the team I was working with at the University of Vermont in graduate school, one of them was Stuart Avers, who was a young psychiatrist at the time. He was very productive and energetic, but he was from the UK. He's from uh, England, London, actually. And uh, as he was into his late thirties and 40, he was ready to be a chair of psychiatry somewhere. And he flattered me greatly. I was a senior graduate student at the time. We had a very productive clinical research program going. And you said, David, I'm gonna to look to be a chair of psychiatry. Would you have some interest in joining me? I said, yes, I certainly would, you know, but he didn't, he hadn't found, located this job. Yeah. So he, the MO would be, he would go and look at various positions that were open, chair of psychiatry. And then he'd come back and tell me about it and said, oh, not that one, this one. And uh, one day he came back and said, David, I think I found it. I think I found the right position. Because again, the background was remember in those days that everything was wall to wall psychoanalytic thinking. There was no biological psychiatry. There was certainly no uh, behavioral programs. So there were cliques of psychoanalyst of different sorts of persuasions. So I came back and said, I think I found the place. I said, oh, really? And he said, would you like to come down and see it? I said, well, sure, Wh where is it? He said, well, it's a place called <laughs> Mississippi. I said, oh my God, you know? In later weeks, I went to my friends and said, where do you think the last place in the world would be? I'd be looking for a job. They say North Dakota or something. They said, oh, Mississippi. And not to disparage anything about Mississippi, I came to be very fond of the place and have great friends there. But I took the job. And uh, several years later, I became president of the state association. I don't think they could find anybody else <laughs> in those days. But, and we were lobbying the legislature, which was in Jackson. I'm getting back to the TV theme again, TV programs. We were lobbying the legislature to pass a bill creating a department of mental health. It's the last state in the country to have, not have a department of mental health at the state level. And uh, we were fighting the medical society who wanted psychiatry to be 
the, the legislation to state that a psychiatrist would be the head of it and the whole board would be physicians, half psychiatrists, half non-psychiatric physicians. And uh, that would be run the state department of mental health. And our little psychological association teamed up with the state mental health association, the citizens advocacy group. And we lobbied the legislature, we fought that, we presented our alternative bill and um, we had, we developed a champion who was in the legislature of Mississippi. And in, in, I got to be friendly with him and I'd say, gee, you know, it's really great that you see the, you know, the psychology, you see the value of psychology. And, and I said, uh, you know, do you know some psychologists? Uh, you know, do you, do you have, uh, you know, some, and he said, no, but I've seen this television program. <laughs> And you remember the one in the 60s, the comedian uh, who- Newhart. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. Newhart, Bob Newhart. The Bob Newhart show and he was, you know, one of his early, before he was an innkeeper, he was yeah. and uh, psychologist. And, and that's the reason we have a State Department of Mental Health in Mississippi where the second commissioner was a psychologist. So long way around, I'm much too chatty, but uh, uh, I was very interested in from an early age, and um, I had the good fortune, Notre Dame, interestingly enough, did not have a psychology major. Hmm. They were, you know, a good Catholic university, and the philosophy of Catholic university, many Catholic universities, not all in those days, was that anything important in psychology would be subsumed under Thomas Aquinas and, and uh, philosophy. philosophy. But they, they had many courses. And so I took the, the various courses that I could gather. And then one summer, a course they did not have was experimental psychology, which was required for any graduate school, of course, undergrad experimental. And I went back to Boston looking for something to do in the summer that I could get that course under my belt. And there were several three credit courses around Northeastern, Harvard, but there was one six credit course, which, which was what I needed in six weeks at Boston College. And the guy who taught it was a guy named Joe Cotella. And he became, uh, you know, became very good friends. And uh, I ended up after Notre Dame going to Boston College to work with him for my master's degree. So all these serendipitous things uh, sort of uh, fell into place, TV programs and practical jokes and, uh, you know, needing a course and it happened to be uh, a course with Joe Cotella. Um, I should let you know that as you're talking about Mississippi, Dr. Catherine Nordahl has uh, joined the board of trustees of the APF. Uh, Catherine was um, in Mississippi when Dave and I were both there and overlapped with each of us um, as a wonderful representative of um, that Mississippi group. Um, Dave, one of the things that's very obvious to me and was obvious to me when I started graduate school in 73 and was this incredible productivity um, uh, that you led at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And that work actually um, influenced me. How, you know, today it's more common to see these remarkably productive people with you know, dozens and dozens of papers in a year. Um, how did that happen at the University of Mississippi Medical Center? What were the role models? What, what, what was the, um, um, the, the esprit de corps that led to such an amazing level of productivity in those four or five years? Well, that's, you know, that's an, a very interesting question too. Stuart Agris was once pointed out. So Stuart Agris was chair of the department in Jackson for about five years and he moved on to Stanford and where he had, remains to this day, you know, at, at age uh, 92, I believe. Uh, still productive, and up until at least a year ago with grants, grants, grant support. Uh, so obviously that's one answer. He was, you know, a role model of someone who was just really interested in clinical research too. I mean, really, 
you know, patient oriented research, not, not just research for, you know, other kinds of. So um, when we were, it goes back to Vermont, when we were at the University of Vermont as a team, Stuart Agris and Harold Leitenberg, my, my mentor, who was an animal operant trained psychologist at the time. And Stuart, of course, was a clinically trained uh, psychiatrist from uh, England who had done his residency at McGill. So, and I had come up from working with Joseph Wolpe, one of the fathers of behavior therapy. I had spent a summer working with him in Philadelphia prior to going to grad, uh, Vermont for the PhD. So we formed a very um, cohesive team. We were very focused on research. Harold brought in some, the, the sort of operant methodology, which was single case, you know, Skinnerian sort of uh, intensive analysis of the single case. And what we did, what was one of our contributions was we adapted that to clinical research, clinical programs, and then we, you know, that resulted in a book in the early 70s on single case designs for clinical research. But the way we organized things, um, in those days in Vermont, the NIH was, was uh, funding clinical research units. This was medical center wide. This was not just mental health or behavioral health, it was medical center wide. And they would totally pick up the cost of seven or eight, nine beds in the hospital where anybody could apply to the local committee with a research proposal that would require, you know, stay in the hospital. Well, you know, even those days, how expensive that was, <clears throat> let alone now. And um, University of Vermont was a small place. Ordinarily, you'd expect medicine and surgery to take up most of those bids. They didn't take up any bids. We said, we'll, well, we can, you know, look at the research we could do. So if uh, we could use those bids. So we would bring in very severe patients, uh, housebound patients with housebound with agoraphobia. Turns out they had agoraphobia. The diagnoses were not so clear in those days, but that's what it was. Panic disorder with agoraphobia. Hadn't been out of the house for a decade. Bring them in the ambulance, sedated, and put them in a bed, begin working with them. Severe OCD. Uh, again, where they would be totally incapacitated with day long, you know, rituals uh, continually, uh, all their waking hours. Uh, poor young girls and some young women with eating disorders that were on death's door in those days, you know, no specialty clinics in those days for eating disorders. And we put them in the beds and we would work with them and their therapists were most, well, it was me initially, and then some of my other psychology graduate students. And we would meet two hours a day for the research. We'd be collecting data. We'd be developing measures, often de novo, because there wasn't much available in the mid 60s for, for that sort of thing in terms of established measures of these various uh, uh, pathologies. And um, <clears throat> we'd meet two hours a day and we would go over data, we'd go over strategies and we will follow them along, you know, with the intensive daily measurement, uh, weekly measurement. And um, in the characteristic of the single case designs, we might be switching from one behavioral procedure to another and looking at the effects, switching back. Um, we'd have people who had severe conversion disorders who couldn't walk anymore, even though physically there was no reason for this to take place. I mean, we had all these very interesting cases. It wasn't focused on just one disorder in those days. And, um, and this resulted in uh, you know, a lot of information, a lot of data, and we began publishing that. And we carried that over when Stuart and I went to Mississippi you know, we carried that research team 
collaborative team, uh, you know, over it, it, working with, in those days was kind of unusual to work with real patients. You know, a lot of psychologists would work with college sophomores who were afraid of snakes or, you know, these analog situations. Mm -hmm. But we had these real patients. That's because through Stuart Eggers, you know, we got a hold of them in that uh, research grant. And then in Mississippi, of course, we had, uh, you know, all of the clinical uh, patients who many of whom would consent to various research projects. So we carried over that kind of, um, you know, zeitgeist or that, that MO, that method of operation, um, you know, into Mississippi and our team grew. And so, you know, we were able to be uh, very productive. And also much of our research in those days was single case research. So you really needed three, six, eight patients you didn't need a hundred, you know, for a big clinical trial or something. You could do very tightly controlled, you know, uh, research. And the journals were very receptive to it, uh, even though they didn't know much about it. <laughs> you know, because the single case research was new, new methodology. And uh... so it, you actually touched upon something that I wanted to ask you about. And that is, you know, you've developed treatments for many different conditions. And you've just explained why you had units where patients with the most severe conditions move forward. Um, but I always wonder about um, the clinical treatments driving the productivity or the contributions or the methodologies driving the contributions. And yeah. you, know, you, you, you actually have a career in methods and you have a career in treatment interventions. Uh, how did those two things play off? And what's what's the enduring contribution of Dave Barlow to um, the future, the next hundred years? Well, that's, uh, of course, something that uh, is not for me to decide. And, and um, I guess time will tell. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think the methodology, but Michelle Herson, my colleague, Michelle Herson, when I got to... Uh, Mississippi, it was an interesting transition. In fact, there may be some things that even you don't know about this, Terry, but uh, um, so I had come out of Vermont, you know, as kind of a lowly graduate student. And when I got to the, the medical center at Mississippi, very suddenly I, I assumed three titles. So I was a chief psychologist at the medical center well, there weren't many psychologists there, <laughs> except the ones we were above the high. I was acting chief psychology at the VA. Did you know that? That was acting I chief at the VA. I did not know that, no. Yeah, Jackson, yeah. yeah. So it was one of your, I was your predecessor. Yeah. You know. Um, Again. Because there were several, they had recently built the VA on the medical center campus. And, um, there were some psychologists there who were not at all appreciated by the staff, by, by the administration of the VA. And so they, they were only too glad to try to move them on. Um, interestingly, they blamed us for it, but it wasn't, it wasn't our, anyway. Uh, so I was acting chief of the VA, no psychologist <laughs> left. And then I was director of the internship. There were no interns. You know, I was asked to form an internship. <laughs> So I had all these titles and, but there was no substance to them because there was nobody there to, uh, uh, to direct. But um, I think that um, number one, the single K getting back to the, uh, the, the influences and what I might be remembered for in years to come, certainly that adaptation of the single case kind of intensive, it was taking the case study and building it into something where you could have, you know, internal validity and make some scientific conclusions from it and have them be potentially generalizable by replicating them on additional cases. And that was a very convenient confluence of Harold Leitenberg, who had never seen a patient in his life, until they got to, uh, until well after he had arrived at Vermont, but had worked in the animal laboratories with the Skinnerian methodologies. Stuart Agris with his clinical work was very open to this stuff. 
And me, who was the only one at the time who knew anything about behavior therapy, because I'd worked with Volpe, you know, in Philadelphia. And we put that methodology, you know, we melded that methodology to see how could it be adapted to these very severe cases with whom we were working. And the methodology um, clearly has been very well received and now has extended well beyond behavioral health to uh, through the various uh, medical specialties, uh, but also through like occupational therapy, physical therapy, things where it's hard to accumulate these large numbers of patients, you know, for big clinical trials. Not that we didn't end up doing big clinical trials, but nevertheless, that methodology has been important. But the other thing, interestingly, was that uh, what drove my career. So, you know, I've been fortunate to do a lot of research, have a good team around me, have the facilities, have the, the settings where that could be accomplished. But what drove my career at almost every stage was not the research, but the training. And that may be a bit of a surprise. Um, so one of the main reasons to go to Mississippi was to start the internship program. Now I never did an internship myself. You know, at the University of Vermont in those days, the clinical training was pretty much what we'd call these days practica, practicum training. You know, I did various practicum and I was seeing patients, you know, pretty much all day, every day, there was severe patients that I would be often the therapist for, along with my uh, graduate student colleagues, because no one else had the time to devote that much time to it. Um, and then after five years, when Stuart Agris moved to Stanford, um, the previous year, the chair, the brand new chair of the psychiatry department at Brown came down to do a grand rounds in Jackson. And uh, shortly after we complete, you know, we spent time with him and all that sort of around. And shortly afterwards, when he went back to Providence where he was beginning to build the psychiatry department at Brown, he gave me a call and said, you know, and uh, basically he recruited me to come to Brown, not because of my research, although I was you know, already a full professor at that time because of the productivity, but because he wanted to do the internship at Brown. He was so impressed with the training program at Mississippi that he wanted to create that at Brown. So yeah. the reason I went to Brown was to basically do a replication of the training program in Mississippi, the internship program. And uh, and to sort of complete the circle, you know, when I came back to Boston 30 years ago, um, <clears throat> this would be the mid nineties now, um, BU, they were, you know, obviously very happy about when they, when they called to recruit, they were very happy about the research because that was sort of the, you know, they needed that to uh, legitimize the appointment and all that. But what they really wanted was to take over the clinical program and rebuild it. It had, it had fallen into kind of uh, a uh, disrepair, we would say, and they were ready to accredit it um, as they had the counseling program some years uh, earlier. And so it was to rebuild the clinical program. So the interesting thing was almost Every, every move I made, it was only like three moves, was driven by, except the one to Albany, was driven by training. So I'm very proud of the fact that the training programs, as you alluded to in the beginning, you know, in Jackson and in Brown, have endured to this day, thanks to wonderful people who took them over and uh, developed them further. Mm -hmm. and are considered to be, you know, outstanding programs. And so that's something of a legacy, at least in my mind. Oh, I think so. 
<clears throat> Dave, just a, a, a slight detour here. Um, you spent like the last decade or so um, uh, sort of trying to figure out what's next in psychology. And, you know, one of the things that everybody has worried about is the manualization of clinical interventions and treatment programs. And, um, and, and you and a few other people concurrently um, across the world actually um, um, decided that this may not be uh, suitable for training clinicians um, to provide healthcare in this country. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, the manuals, what their use was, why they were valuable, and then <clears throat> why this transition now to what I would call principles of change. What, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yep, that's been a that's been a very interesting and in many ways ironic development because there are some people, rightly or wrongly, who credit me with starting the whole manualized uh, uh, movement in psychology. You know, writing manuals with some of the early manuals for panic disorder in the late eighties, uh, and that actually is inaccurate. The individual as best we can determine who really started manualizing psychotherapeutic uh, programs was Hans Strupp. The, from a psychoanalytic point of view when he was at Vanderbilt. But he realized at the time that it was important to operationalize what therapists were doing if we were ever going to study the influence of what they were doing you know, on uh, outcomes for various uh, problems. But we, uh, you know, carried that on and developed early manuals for panic disorder. And then it led to uh, other manuals. And with the feedback we got was that clinicians found them very useful. And they found them, they found these very helpful, you know, as they were, uh, you know, to treat their patients who would come in with generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, depression, what have you. And so we were really seemed to be meeting a need. So we ramped that up. We even started our own company to uh, produce those manuals and ultimately uh, sold it. Um, however, um, you know, to your point, even from the late eighties, these manuals were interestingly, they were driven by the DSM um, that really became influential in 1980, the DSM-3. Before that, it was widely ignored. You know, the categories were vague and precise. They weren't well-defined. Uh, in this country, most psychiatrists didn't pay any attention to them. You know, they would much, be focused much more individually on, on the case, the patient in front of them. And, not worry too much about what the diagnosis was. The DSM changed that, became very influential, became extraordinarily influential around the world. We did studies on that. You know, it far surpassed the ICD, the other, the International Classification of Diseases and Mental Disorders, far surpassed it in terms of uh, influence. Um, and of course the drug companies loved it because um, they could get a new indication now that there were official diagnoses. Uh, you know, uh, there was social anxiety and panic disorder and all these. They could get a new indication from the FDA for every single one of them, even though it'd be the same drug, <laughs> you know, but uh, it would be profitable for them. So, but <clears throat> we, the psychological treatments <clears throat> that we developed, um, First of all, were effective. Secondly, it's been demonstrated they were at least as effective as the drug treatments. Initially, the uh, tricyclics, then it went to the SSRIs, at least as effective as the drug treatments and more endurable. Steve Holland has been perhaps the most influential in publishing data supporting that uh, thesis. So these manuals were good for. Uh, you know, people who were interested in psychological treatments. And when you look at our patients, when you survey them, three out of every four would much rather 
be treated with a psychological treatment than with a drug. So, so that was a good thing. So to get to your point though, <clears throat> then what was the consequence of all this? So the manuals proliferated. We published our manual on panic disorder. It wasn't too many years before there were 20 manuals on panic disorder, all pretty much saying the same thing, changing some sentences here and there to abide by the copyright laws, but pretty much the same thing. And then the same with other disorders, depression. So um, how's the clinician to choose? You know, and they all had training programs connected with them. Um, and uh, it became very, it, it was not serving our fundamental purpose of trying to disseminate the best psychological interventions we had out to the population. I think we had taken our eye off the ball, even though I, people say I was possibly responsible for a lot of that. Now, I will uh, certainly admit to that uh, back in the 90s. So we began looking at, you know, what are the fundamental, when you take the anxiety disorders, the depressive disorders, some of the closely related disorders, and you look at these treatments with evidence for success, what do they have in common? Well, a lot of them are doing the same thing, it seemed to us, it seemed to me. A lot of them are doing the same thing. And I took inspiration from a British psychiatrist, uh, Chris Fairburn, <clears throat> who had worked, very influential work with eating disorders. And he said, there's a program for anorexia, there's a program for bulimia, there's a program for binge eating disorder, but they're all pretty much the same. And can we create a transdiagnostic program for all of the eating disorders? And there's all these people with eating disorders who don't might meet any of the, those diagnoses. 40, 50% don't quite fit into the DSM categories, but they have the same kinds of issues going on. And he developed his transdiagnostic uh, treatment in the early 90s. And <clears throat> knowing him well, I said, you know, we can do that for the emotional disorders, what we're calling the emotional disorders. The disorders characterized by severe emotion dysregulation. And we began looking at what are the common elements here? What are the things that are common to these things? And um, we came up with, I think in the late 80s, I first stated a, in a book I wrote, a potential transdiagnostic, what, what didn't call it that at that, at that time, but a, a treatment that would be applicable to the full range of disorders. Um, I, I called it a, a name that didn't stick, effective therapy. <laughs> But it was affect, you know, it was the notion that we were treating the emotion. And uh, in the meantime, we're doing big clinical trials on our manuals because that's where the money was, frankly. A lot of money on the table in those days for those trials, supporting our research efforts. But, you know, we kept that idea in our minds. And then in the early 2000s, said, here's what a treatment like that might look like. And it turns out the emotional disorders and particularly for the people listening who have more traditional uh, memories of more traditional views, it mirrors the old neurotic spectrum, the whole neurotic dimension of disorders that goes all the way back to DSM one and two. And uh, it's basically the non-psychotic disorders exclude the, including some of the personality disorders like borderline. You know, that would fit very well into the emotional disorders. And so what we spent the last 20 years on then, as you well know, is trying to develop fundamental principles that would be applicable to all of these disorders. So clinicians could go in with these, we, we think there's five core principles and basically adapt them to any a patient with, uh, you know, some an emotional disorder uh, component sitting in, in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's still a very interesting. 
Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but there is a lot of support. I think that's coming <clears throat> your way on this and that of Chris Fairburn. Let me ask you another question slightly different. And that is that the last couple of years, the American Psychological Association um, um, has really decided that um, they need to provide additional support and assistance to um, preparing master's degree uh, psychologists. And uh, this was, of course, controversial over the years. You know, they were thinking that the doctoral degree was the degree that you would get and to be a practicing clinician. And uh, things change for a variety of reasons, of course. And um, I, I'm just kind of wondering um, what your thoughts are for <clears throat> the role of master's prepared psychologists and then the role of doctoral prepared psychologists. And be aware that I'm gonna come back to ask you about what you think of um, the training models that we have at the doctoral level. But if you can just tell me what your thoughts are. And I, I will just say too that um, I know Lynn Bufka is here and Lynn Bufka goes back uh, uh, with Dave and I to Boston University. And she's kind of um, uh, providing a great deal of leadership here to try to um, address things that have been ignored for a very long time. Um, but Dave, what are your thoughts? Master's prepared, doctoral prepared um, psychologists. Well, it's a very timely uh, topic. And I, I know Lynn, Lynn is, uh, Lynn Bufka from APA is, is listening. And um, so there will be, I'm pretty sure there will be, Lynn can, can uh, chat at me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think it's pretty certain there'll be a summit in September, that since the APA has very wisely, I think, passed a uh, policy um, that would uh, accommodate master's level psychologists and create, you know, uh, uh, approved training programs and credentialing for master's level psychologists, um, then the question becomes, all right, um, if this has been, if, if this is the future, and it is, it's again, been approved by council, if, if, if this is the future, then what is, what's the implication of this for training models for both the master's level psychologist and the uh, doctor level psychologist, and how will that change? Um, let me interject at this point that I'm having um, a deep immersion these days in frontline delivery of mental health care here on my little island of Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts, where I spend at least six months a year. So I'm on the board of the local mental health center. Nantucket Island is, has about uh, 15, 17,000 year round people and about 50% of them are um, um, not all Hispanic, largely Hispanic, some from Eastern Europe and Russia who have come here uh, you know, to, to uh, make a living. Of course, in the summer, the population expands to 40, 50,000 with, with the summer people who own 80% of the housing stock and you know, that's the economy of the island. So the year-round people are often, you know, working in the restaurants and construction, landscaping, and uh, doing support for this uh, summer housing stock. And we have our own mental health center, and we're kind of a microcosm in that we're 30 miles out to sea. <clears throat> As Terry knows, he, just, he lives on the Cape, not not far from us, Cape Cod, uh, in the summer, and. Uh, there's no going to the next town if you have a problem. We have a little hospital, um, but any major problem you have to be, go off island to Boston or someplace like that for a medical issue. For mental health, you know, this is pretty much it. You can't see a practitioner in the next town. So in our mental health center, you know, one of the things I discovered is that everyone everyone delivering frontline care 
is a licensed mental health counselor or at a higher level, a licensed social worker, not one psychologist. And so uh, there is one psychologist who consults in the summer and we have a psychiatrist who consults from, from a distance. Uh, you know, um, then I, I contacted my friend in Boston or I, I had been in touch with my friend over the years in Boston, a woman named Nancy Lane, who was a Rutgers PhD, worked with Peter Nathan, who ran the company that had the, they call it mass health, uh, behavioral health, but it was the, it's the Medicaid uh, contract for the state of Massachusetts for behavioral health. And I said, Nancy, what's, going on, all the mental health centers around the state, you know, that the state has set up that, that will, will take, uh, particularly for the poor folks, you know, the lower income folks, the people who don't have any options. Um, do we have trained psychologists, you know, in this center? Not one psychologist in the whole system mm -hmm. is out there delivering frontline services. It's all the licensed mental health counselors and most states now, because of that, you know, have created licenses for the mental health counselors and programs have sprung up, you know, or addiction counselors or, or what have you. And so th this, uh, the notion of training masses level psychologists in psychology departments for service delivery seems to me um, you know, it's never too late, but I wish we had done it 20 or 30 years ago, you know, then we could have, because then we would have been able to take these folks and ensure they were trained in, you know, the latest uh, kind of evidence-based uh, psychological uh, treatments and mental health generally. And related them more closely to the doctor level psychologist who could work, you know, closely in uh, leadership positions, in supervision positions, in program development and evaluation, and, um, and, and also be available for the specialty practice, you know, the tough cases. Um, Jonathan Comer and I wrote an article in AP uh, a few years ago on you know, we'll never have fully integrated training. There's always going to be uh, integrated, meaning integrated into the uh, primary care health uh, delivery uh, system. There's always going to be, um, you know, a need for specialty clinics for the severe OCD patients with, with kids um, um, and, you know, some of the other eating disorders, some of the other severe cases that are going to require, you know, doctor level psychologists. <clears throat> but for the fully integrative care, which APA has been, you know, uh, very much behind um, in recent years. Um, you know, the the day to day care for the for the, uh, the average problems that come into mental health centers, the family problems, the child behavioral problems, um, you know, the anxiety, the depression. You know, um, there's no way that doctor level personnel. Even in Massachusetts, we have the densest uh, population of doctoral level mental health providers probably in the world. You know, maybe New York City is more, but uh, you know, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, we can't touch, you know, there's not a single psychologist on the front lines delivering care to the most needy person. So, I mean, that, that alone, I'm sure these, that this kind of information uh, facilitated the passage of this policy by council uh, last year. So this this upcoming summit on what's the future of training for the master's level and the doctoral level psychologist. To me, this is a watershed summit. You know, this is going to be the equivalent of the Boulder model in 1949 that the summit and the, the ones that followed and then the veil conference in 73 or 4 
that looked at, you know, the more professional model of training. And what's this going to be? This is going to, in many ways, trump the both of them. Excuse the word. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be, I think, uh, you know, extremely important as we really chart the course for the future training of psychologists who can truly serve the people who most need it. Dave, I think um, perhaps we would agree that the uh, the PhD in clinical psychology is the only doctoral level healthcare provider where both science and clinical practice are integrated. Yeah. Um, and I bray, I spent <clears throat> my entire forty some odd year career in healthcare settings and. Um, I brag about the fact that we are the only ones that have done this. Can we continue to do it? And how do you see this training moving forward? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really happy you, you, you brought that up um, because um, this really touches on the theme that I have been very committed to my, my whole career and continue to be committed to. Um, early on, I became very uh, entranced, impressed with the writings of David Chakow. David Chakow, certainly the people listening in will know, uh, is widely considered the father of clinical psychology. He was the spearhead of the Boulder Conference on training scientist practitioners. Um, back in the, in the late 40s. Um, he participated in every important uh, early event that set policy in psychology. He, he uh, officially retired in, I, I had written, I wrote a long article about David Shackow at one point. So I know some of these, some of these facts. He, he officially retired in 66, I think. I had the privilege and, and just to continue with that. And yet he kept, he kept working. He was a busy retiree, so something of a role model. Um, at, at that point, he had been many places such as McLean Hospital in Boston, Worcester State. But he ended up at the, the uh, NIMH where he ran the laboratory of psychology. And he retired from there in 1966, but he continued, he went to work every day and uh, continued to write and, and think and consult. And uh, he literally died with his boots on one day in his office, you know, in 1981 uh, at the age of 80. Now entering my 80th year as I did recently, uh, I'm not, I don't care for that part of his existence. <laughs> but I will say that, that um, he fervently believed his whole life that you could integrate science and practice. And the scientist practitioner model of training turned out to be the envy of the world in the 70s and 80s. And if you go around the world, you know, you see all these psychologists coming up, oh, we need this to, for, you know, this scientist practitioner model, it gives us legitimacy, it gives us new skills, Australia, the Europe, uh, developing countries and the like. And I'm a bit sad to see us get away from that in the recent years. And I'm, I'm something of an outlier in this regard. So now we see people, our programs, including our Boston programs, going over and stewing the title of scientist practitioner and going to clinical scientist programs. And they say their avowed model is to turn out people who do full-time research and uh, probably join the faculty. Um, this was not David Shackow's vision. David Shackow's vision was that you could not be a good scientist unless you had intimate familiarity with clinical practice. And you could not be a good practitioner unless you were fully versed in the tenets of psychological science meaning 
mostly the thinking, the critical thinking, not every experiment that was ever done, you know, but the critical thinking that allowed you to, you know, that, that facilitated you really evaluating uh, the evidence. He had a vision of a scientist practitioner that I think is going to be now much more in demand and once again, rejuvenated and needed as we move into this new era. And I hope the summit, you know, that occurs at, at APA might look back. David Shacko published his uh, vision for the future of clinical psychology in the late 60s and early 70s. And you could almost take it verbatim, I think, and uh, say this may be the future of doctoral training in clinical psychology. If you, you've been enormously generous to the American Psychological Foundation, not just tonight, but um, you've given of your time and your treasure. Um, the Dave and Beverly Barlow Award is one of our most generous awards. And uh, this is an endowment that you've provided us and we receive so many applications for it and such outstanding people receive this award. Um, I just have to ex express my appreciation to you for doing this. But I'm curious what your motivation is. And, you know, uh, not everybody gives faithfully and gives certainly at the levels that you've given. What, what was it about um, APF that caught your attention and caught your interest? Well, I'll say, first of all, you know, my wife and I, my wife Beverly and I, both came actually from modest means. You know, we were both the first in our families to go to college. And, uh, you know, Beverly was with me every step of the way when we founded our little business, you know, producing psychology manuals in the 90s. Beverly did it. She uh, started in our basement and then we expanded. So, and um, I've had a rich and rewarding career. And we, have been very blessed, I think, to be able to do something as um, to be able to follow, uh, you know, a psychological career where you're fundamentally concerned with helping people. So it certainly seemed to, to us, given that we were blessed to have been uh, uh, successful uh, in our career, that there was nothing more important than giving back. And the APF um, seemed to me to be, you know, perhaps the best vehicle for accomplishing that and helping the, <clears throat> the next generation of psychologists fulfill some of their dreams as we have been so fortunate to fulfill ours. Um, so there is no truth to the fact that Lisa Strauss beat you in an arm wrestling. One well, there's a little bit of that, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Dave Barlow, thank you very, very much for um, speaking with us today in APF at Home, um, our fireside traps. Dave, of course, is an APF Gold Medal Award winner, and we are just delighted that you were willing and able to share with us some of your perspectives, both historic as well as future. Um, thanks very much. Thanks to all of you um, who have tuned in to APF at Home, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again in the next time. Thanks very, very much, everybody. Appreciate Thank you, it. Terry. My pleasure.